Thank you. Talk about a golden age to come. Here it is. Well, I am not a businesswoman. I wish I was. And I'm not a wealthy woman. I wish I was. <laughs> I am a public school teacher. My people are five years old. The oldest are 12. You might wonder what I'm doing here. A few years ago, I stood in front of my students and I asked them to empty their pockets. Let's see how much money we can pool to make a difference. A bingo chip and an elastic band. Okay, so who gets to make the decisions then? The wealthy? Do we have no say because we have no money? I asked them. We felt poor at that moment. And then I looked at them and I said, how many of you have more than one pair of shoes? Mm -hmm. How many of you have more than one hoodie? Mm -hmm. How many of you have at least one electronic game in your home? Mm -hmm. We felt very rich at that moment. And that's when an idea was born. We called it Raise Your Voice. I had a colleague on staff, Erica Van Oyen, who had traveled with an, a local organization, Nateo, Nateo Africa, whose founder is sitting with us today, Karine Veldon. She had been traveling to and from Uganda, volunteering her off hours, her off work hours, her summers, her spring breaks, working in the most impoverished neighborhoods, orphanages, schools, in and around Kampala. And she was a voice for change on our staff. And so the students and I decided to join in on the cause. We had a concert coming up. We thought, why not make it a benefit concert? Well, that prompted more conversation. What's the difference? A concert versus a benefit concert. What's the difference? Drumming in class or drumming for peace? How can we make a difference? This gave birth to another idea we call the month of love. And we did this two years ago. We decided we're not going to charge money for people to come to the con concert because there is no change that happens in our hearts when we go to somebody older than us and say, can I have some money, and then we hand it to the cause. What could we do to actually start to understand our wants versus our needs as young people who have so much future and so much to give, whether or not their pockets are empty? The month of love was structured like this. We encouraged families to go home and sit down. Not everybody did. Not everybody joins every cause. That's okay. But a lot of them did. And the challenge was, decide during this month, February, the month of Valentine's Day, the month of love, decide on one thing, not a need, one want. One want that your family will give up for one month. So they filled out the paperwork. I gave up lattes. And I put $45 in an envelope. Some families gave up their pizza night. They didn't go out for pizza. They stayed home and they made pizza that month. And they put $35 in the envelope. Some of our mothers said, we will paint our own nails this month. We're going to give up our manicures. $45. $65. One month. Some families encouraged their children to think it through and the children came up with the idea of giving their own birthday money. Did anyone in this group do that? There he is. There they are. Their own birthday money. I don't think they're any... Yeah. <laughs> they're still living good lives. 
Some gave up their paper route money for one month. And there was even a family that said on the paper, we are giving up specialty dog bones. <laughs> sometimes they're $4 and sometimes they're 12. We did our concert. We called it Raise Your Voice. Kareen came and we presented her a check for $13,000, one month, one thing. Not even everybody participated. And I thought to myself, what if every school in our valley did this? What if it could become a part of this great vision for the future? What if every school in our country challenged for one month, one thing? What kind of a difference could we make? Erica Van Oyen had shown us pictures of these students who would never hope to own a pair of shoes over and in and around the impoverished neighborhoods of Kampala. They never would own a hoodie. They would never own an electronic game. And Erica told me they did not have books in their schools, and I did not believe her. I thought that meant some books, not as much as ours, not as many as we have. But I'd caught the bug, that contagious thing that changes you from the inside out. And I fundraised with my children, and we went. And I saw for myself, I saw for myself neighborhoods with no books and no opportunity to equip these sweet orphans who had become orphans through malaria, through AIDS, through war, and yes, the Lord's Resistance Army and the effects, the ravages on the people. I saw them, and I rode in a van that was purchased by the students of Glenmore Elementary, the Niteo Africa van, whose charge that van is supposed to, and every, its objective is to deliver the used resources that we have sent over from the Okanagan Valley, resources that were headed for the dump. Seriously. Parents gave books, puzzles, Organizations gave books. Our school continues to give books. They're sitting on my stage right now in my classroom. And they reclaimed their luster over there. I was so embarrassed because I traveled across the ocean carrying three hockey bags full of used Glenmore Elementary lost and found shoes. And I said to Erica, my colleague, this is embarrassing. What are they going to do with these? They're dirty. They're used. They, they, nobody wants them. And I couldn't get an organization to give me new shoes in time. I was learning. Well, this is the neighborhood we went to. You see a little sign there, the dental clinic. This is Natete. And in Natete is a school called Living Hope. And in Living Hope, there were no books. And students, all orphans, would line up at 10.30 for their three-quarter or maybe a half cup of porridge a day. And that was their sustenance. And we gave them the shoes. And they looked so good. They looked so good. And Erica said to me, Rhonda, we have come to a place where so little is so much. And I became overwhelmed. And I started to despair. Because I thought about all the problems we had in Kelowna, and all the problems we had in Canada. And then there were these problems over here, in a place where there are no systems for handling garbage, and there's no system for old age. In fact, life expectancy was 45 in the neighborhoods we spend time in. And I thought, there's too much, too much work to be done. There's too much work to be done. It's impossible. And something happened inside my head. Maybe that's why I'm a music teacher. But I heard a small melody while riding in a van 
having visited the king's daughters, young girls who are rescued from the street by a woman named Sally, who I expected to be a grandmother bear of a woman, and she was this tiny 29-year-old woman who has seen the girls on the street, and she takes them into her home. I had gone there, I had gotten out of the van, and felt arms wrap around me, and I thought, wait a second, I'm supposed to be coming here to help you. And my, I had to take my sweater and hold it to my eyes. And I wept for 45 minutes while they embraced me. <laughs> I, I, I almost came completely undone. That's why I had to have my sweater over my eyes. I knew if I looked, that was it. And then they started to sing. Singing like I have tried to draw out of my beautiful children, effort upon effort. Singing that comes so effortlessly for them because they know what music does. They know it renews the spirit, and they need their spirits renewed. They know it transcends. They know it helps them transcend the atrocities that they've endured. They get a moment of relief, and during those moments of relief, change happens. I was in the van. I heard this little melody. I grabbed my friend's journal, and I started writing down the words that were coming to me. There's too much to do. The voice said, but there's something you can do. I, I'm, I'm overwhelmed. I can't do this. Let your spirit be renewed as we raise our voice in song. And we hope you'll sing along. We drove back once this song was written and filmed Sally's Girls on a digital camera singing it. And now, having come back here, I had to find a way maker, because as I confessed at the beginning of this talk, I am not a wealthy woman. I found a way maker. I encourage us to keep talking in this venture of, of, of a golden age for the future, of positive change through entrepreneurship. And my way, my way maker was David Veldon from Shorestone Homes. He said, hey, I hear you want to record a song. I'll pay for that. I went, oh took the footage to a local um, um, recording studio, and he drew the voices off this, this um, digital recording. And I sang to him the song, played it out, and it's now on iTunes. And my goal, my dream, is 100,000 Canadian voices. I'm not there yet. I need your help. I'm stumbling along on this journey of positive change through entrepreneurship in a climate that often has roadblocks. The teacher strike. <laughs> Job action. You know, sometimes hesitant administration that goes, <gasps> I don't want to tick anybody off. Or maybe I get tired. When I get tired, we sing, it does renew my spirit. Really, they're a gift to me every day. They think I'm teaching them. And I look for signs along the way. Signs, signs that will help me carry on. And one of the signs is a quote that came recently to me. Never let the odds keep you from what you know in your heart you have to do. There is something we can do. Let your spirit be renewed as we raise our voice in song and we hope you'll sing along. Here are the students of Glenmore Elementary singing with the orphans from King's Daughters. those smiles. The time has come, so one by one, we will raise our voice in song. One becomes two, soon it's me and you, and our voices become strong. 